Okay, uh, this is a great way to wrap it up. The panel is focused on security in the boardroom. Last night, we, a uh, group of us were out to dinner, and there was a couple CISOs I was talking with, and uh, one of the guys said, you know, we always wanted cybersecurity to be taken seriously by senior executives. And then without a b missing a beat, one of the other guys said, well, be careful what you ask for, because it looks like we got it. And I think that's the theme that we're going to start this panel around, that the door is open. And it's great that the door is open. Um, through the day, we talked about the fact, and a lot of the panels have reinforced this, is that many people now see cyber not as a technical risk, but as a business risk and a top business risk. And we quoted, John, some of the work that uh, your firm did, this, the security as a business enabler report, which showed, depending on what number you wanted to cut, 44% of people saw it as a source of competitive differentiation, and a third saw it as actually a primary, primarily saw it as a um, competitive differentiator or business enabler. So those are some of the themes that we're going to build on. We have a fantastic panel. You guys have heard enough of me today. So uh, why don't we go ahead and start with each one of the panelists. If you can just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your perspective, and then we'll go ahead and jump into Q&A. And uh, maybe to make it different, uh, Kevin, we're going to start from the far end and come back right. down here, OK? Thank you. Hi, I'm Kevin Richards. I'm a managing director with Accenture. Uh, I lead our global security strategy practice. Uh, for us, uh, the Accenture strategy's motto is we, we live at the intersection of technology and business. Uh, I joke within internally that I live at the collision of security and the business. And, and it, it's absolutely, whether it's number one or two or three, there's a lot of interest in the boardroom of what we're talking about today. And I'm sure we'll all have great stories about this. As I look at it, though, there's a bit of a journey we have to take the boards down because we have, we have interest, we have understanding, and then we have action. We have huge amounts of interest from the board. Every board wants to talk about this. This is both from the, the uh, whether it was the Apple FBI conversation, that was certainly a big thing, uh, how, how easily they could be hacked, what things that should they be worried about, should they change their password? I mean, that's little simple questions. But as we start moving to the right to the understanding part, that's, the, that's where the, our big gap is, because we have interest. We've never had the stage like this before, but getting to that understanding component so that we can direct the proper action, which is the, the last piece. And I think that's the area that we'll talk about today, and I think that's the journey we have to take the boards on. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Wendy Whitmore. I am a partner with IBM Security Services, and at IBM I'm responsible for managing Bonds, remediation and global intelligence practices. Um, my career started uh, actually as a special agent in the U.S. Air Force doing computer crime investigations and uh, then I spent about six years at Mandiant um, prior to their fire eye acquisition uh, doing incident response for organizations within the government and then within um, all sectors really technology, defense, energy, uh, entertainment. As I moved out to the, the West Coast we uh, you know expanded the type of organizations we worked with and then I spent the last four years at CrowdStrike uh, leading their consulting practice. So really looking at everything from how do we accelerate the process of incident response um, to doing things that were more proactive in nature, helping organizations build their security programs. So uh, during today's panel, I'll be sharing some of my experiences uh, just regarding you know, what's it been like to be responding to these major right. security breaches for the last 15 years and how has that changed? And, it is uh, absolutely very different, uh, very drastically different from the conversations from 15 years ago to today in terms of who's actually in those rooms when you're responding to a breach and the level of board involvement. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Joe Ford. I'm the Chief Security Officer at Bank of the West. Uh, I, I've been with the bank about eight years. Uh, I was hired to build an integrated security program for the bank. Uh, back in 2008, uh, from everything from physical security now to uh, cybersecurity. It's been a great uh, ride in trying to see the evolution of how you can build an integrated security program in an institution, especially a complex uh, regulated financial institution. Uh, prior to that, I spent 30 years in the FBI. Uh, I was a, a street agent. Uh, uh, I was also the FBI's chief financial officer. 
and the FBI's chief operating officer. So the uh, the whole concept of uh, cyber cybersecurity now, as I coin it, uh, as opposed to information security, because I believe it's a lot more than that, um, is really taken root uh, not only through the executive ranks of the of the institution, but into the board, and it's been a, an interesting journey, which I'd be happy to share. Hi, my name is John Seward, and Jim, thank you very much for, for hosting us on the panel and the invitation to, to be a part of talking to each and every one of you. Uh, I'll, I'll offer up a variety of perspectives. I've been in the cybersecurity arena for about 28 years. First incident I responded to is the Robert Morris Jr. Worm in 1988, because I was at Syracuse University, which was the center hub of connectivity to Cornell where it all started and it all began. Um, one of the perspectives that I can give you is I've been defending networks of all varieties and types uh, for every single year of my entire professional and collegiate career. The second perspective I can give you is that I actually sit on boards. Um, so I've had the opportunity to be a fiduciary and be responsible for people's money and, and people uh, that expect you to take and pay attention to the risk factors of a given corporation. Um, and then the last perspective uh, I can definitely throw into this is that a you know at a fifty billion dollar company level that's that's basically uh, you know one hundred seventy five thousand networks updating every six minutes trying to protect the planet. I've got a somewhat unique perspective why every one of our customers has started to take it into account and have now briefed I think fourteen public boards personally um, on the topic. Fantastic. Um, I don't need to say this because I know none of you are shy, but uh, we're going to direct a question to each one of you or one of you and feel and we'll free to that yeah, just feel free to jump in. We'll make it a conversation. I want to start with this theme of where we've been to get a sense of where we need to go. Um, Joe, I'd like to start with you. you know, walk us through how the interactions with senior management and the board have evolved and changed and just give us some highlights on how you're seeing them look at security differently today. Yeah, I, th I think if you go back uh, probably three years ago, uh, information security or cybersecurity may have been briefed to senior management and the board once a year. Hmm. It was you know, the annual report uh, that would go to the board and then senior management would get it and um, that would be pretty much the end of it. Uh, about the target, uh, I guess the target time frame probably, uh, even though we started providing some, you know, maybe twice a year briefings to the, to the board uh, around that time. The target breach, I think, changed a lot for a lot of different companies. And all of a sudden, the board started seeing the risk as being much larger, uh, and they, they, they really wanted to get more information. And I think what, what, what I've seen in, since then is now we're quarterly in the board, not just on one report, but multiple issues that we're reporting. Uh, we give a, we, we provide the board a, uh, uh, for, for, for lack of a better word, a state of the institution mm -hmm. briefing, and then there are other things that we that go along with that, whether it's a resiliency briefing or uh, uh, an external assessment or a pen test. So what we what, what we're seeing is that the board, and it's not just for us that we we usually go to the risk committee of the board. Um, it's it ends up being the full board from time to time uh, that is seeing. You know, it wants to know what's going on in the institution from a cyber perspective. Uh, and it's gone from an information security brief to a cyber brief that is a little bit more encompassing around, uh, you know, threat and tell. Uh, they want to know about our, our response planning and our testing. Uh, and they want to know more about just how we're training and awareing our own employees. And to just to, the other thing that I, I think you see from executive management and the board is that this is a, an enabler for the business. Interesting. Um, uh, that a well-run security program can be leveraged uh, for the customer too. And we, we've seen that as being a, a, a unique uh, uh, piece to the program that the, the business leaders are saying, you know, get out there and we want to talk to our customers about cybersecurity. Um, funny story, we had an event in Southern California last year we were talking about business email compromise. Uh, we had about 140 customers that were commercial customers in the room. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the, uh, the, the, the conversation and the, and the presentation, a customer got up and left, and we thought, wow, we probably didn't um, 
you know, wasn't happy with us. And um, turned out that we had called her earlier in that in the day about a business email compromise, and she realized as we were talking about it, she had probably been scammed. So, um, yeah. you know, that in and of itself, you know, uh, just getting that word out was, uh, was a good thing. It's the same question, different perspective. Uh, Wendy, you talked about it in your opening, but between you and Kevin, you guys have been advising executives and boards for a number of years, and you hinted that you've seen a lot of change on that. Can you build on that? Absolutely. So um, I'm certainly, you know, echoing the, the things that Joe's talked about from our client's perspective, you know, much more frequent interaction and requests to um, provide them information that they'll provide to the board, but um, from the incident responders perspective. So I look at uh, you know, 15 years ago, I was in the military. Uh, the breaches were classified. Uh, you know, my parents basically had no idea what I did, right? I couldn't exactly share what I was doing, that we were defending <laughs> networks against foreign governments uh, and that we were responding to breaches. Uh, then, I, you know, I started at Mandiant, and I was thinking back to um, a res an incident which we responded to, which is a public company, a major manufacturing company. And, uh, you know, it was Kevin Mandia and I in a room going to the client site, and uh, you know, we got in, and Kevin was the quarterback, right? It was all right. Here's what's going to happen. You know, we these are the things we know right now. Here's what we've got to find out. We're going to lead you guys through this. And you know, ultimately, for a number of years, that conversation kind of stopped at that level, right? The director of security probably reported it to the CISO, the CIO, and then they chose whether it really kind of went up to the CEO. But a lot of times, you know, you couldn't exactly prove what information was leaving the environment. And there was less reputational and economic risk at that time that was quantifiable. So change that to you know today's environment where uh, you know that it, it's so different. So in terms of going into a room to respond to an incident, um, it's no longer just the technical incident responders, right? You've got the lawyers who are you know ideally are your external counsel mm -hmm. that they're generally the ones that are quarterbacking the incident and they're really working very closely with your teams. You've got the communications teams. Um, ideally, you have you know crisis communications in place in advance uh, that you can then um, have have holding statements and, and all of these things in place that you can help govern how successfully you respond um, by communicating, and that's both externally and internally. Um, and so there there are so many different kind of ways that organizations can prepare now. Mm. But then the the groups are very commonly in the wake of these breaches speaking to. Um, the boards, you know, I've been on, on a number of phone calls and in meetings with the board of directors who ask questions, and um, I'm certainly happy to share that too. But want to spread the spread the uh, wealth here in terms of time. But so many, uh, you know, such a, a level of awareness that's increased, and such a change in how that these breaches are really run. And then, uh, kind of adding on to what what Joe had said, uh, it's now moving into a quarterly conversation with the full board. We're actually seeing the chair of the risk committee having a more one-on-one -on -one relationship with the CISO or the CSO and building more of a rapport of, okay, let's really understand what's going on so that it's not an event. You know, the, if you're spending seven weeks preparing the presentation for your board, and maybe you need to, but, but they, that's not the, the, the frequency of the interaction. They, they wanna understand, are we doing the right things? And frankly, by building that rapport, the, the CISO or the CSO can present better. What, what do you want to hear? I mean, I can talk to you about technology. I can talk to you about risks. I can talk to you about cyber threat. I can talk to you about geopolitical instability. What's going to resonate best? And by having that, that more, more frequent interaction, it's a more productive conversation. And we're seeing that happening more and more with, with the CISO and the, and the boards. I want to come back to a couple of those topics, but um, uh, John, you've got a really interesting role. You're the CSO of a large multinational who just happens to make a lot of the equipment that runs public networks and enterprise networks. So I'm interested in both that perspective, how that changes your role as a CSO, but you're also a chief trust officer. How, how do those two work together and how does that, particularly that latter role, fit into this conversation about security in the boardroom? So one of the aspects I, I think that's kind of fun about my job uh, is that as a result of, of having this word security become as important as it is, we had watched some of the emerging trends starting in 2007 and realized that you could build security products business all day long and, and that's fine, except instead, number one, you're going to have to broaden that definition to actually security capability in anything you build, phone, firewall, you know, video collaboration solution, whatever it is. And 
um, security, the very word, was going to have to shift a little bit to a sort of trustworthy design, data protection and privacy, uh, resiliency, as well as just the traditional notion of the word as we've been talking about for many moons uh, around just quote unquote cyber. So um, part of that shift is just that. I, I now carry the torch, if you will, for, for both sides of that spectrum. And, um, and what you always want, and I've always wanted, is a is a pull mechanism, not a push mechanism. And I think that gets to your point about boards, uh, which is instead of actually saying, look at this, look at this, I really need you to look at this, it should be, we really need to understand this, please come explain it to us because we need to embed it in the business fabric of how we're operating. And so that evolutionary model has taken the InfoSec thing, turned it into a partnership with IT in, in at least 15% of the companies, um, that we talk to, and then there's this 5% that are beginning to emerge that go, you know what, this, this whole InfoSec thing actually should be a business fabric embedded, beginning to end, you know, start off with a new offer definition, new product definition, new whatever definition, and have security embedded all the way through. Now, that gets to your differentiation, it also gets to your board, and it also gets to trust. Mm -hmm. So the dilemma of being a multinational is that, um, and it doesn't matter where your headquarters is if you're a multinational, there's some other country that goes, you know, I'm not so sure I feel very good that you're that US company. Now, if you're a Russian company, it's, I don't know if I feel really good you're a Russian company. And if you're a Chinese company, it's, mm, I don't know, it just depends on where you are on the globe. But something is going to occur that's going to make you ask questions like, should I trust that other thing that you build especially when it's in the, in the center of what I do. Hmm. So not unsurprisingly, as you all have read at least more than once, um, the United States has had a bit of an issue uh, at the government level over some activities that one of our agencies was doing. It got published, it got translated, it got put into German newspapers for our brand. And then all of a sudden we're now in a headwind of should I trust a US corporation called Cisco Systems Inc? And uh, I was personally suddenly answering questions about trust, like, should I trust you? Hmm. Um, I wish I'd thought about the vodka thing. That would have been a smart <laughs> move. That would, I would have gotten there a lot quicker, or I would have gotten weirder answers out of me. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, it, it became a brand requirement for us to be able to continue to do what we do, which is to be in the middle. Um, now, part of that is just being transparent, saying, look, this is who we are. Corporate identity, this is absolutely the principles that we live under, uh, and we publish those on a website called trust.cisco.com. So there could be no confusion. It's not about John being a trust guy. It's about a corporation establishing principles that will outlast me, outlast uh, any of the executives. And the second thing is that it turned it into a business discussion to differentiate our corporation. Hmm. So we actually know that there are products and services that are being purchased from us specifically because of how we design them, how we source them, how we test them, and how we prove without a shadow of a doubt that we adhere to those principles. Hmm. And so it's becoming a pull in the customer just as much as a pull in the board, just as much as a pull in the business. I want to round out that first topic of how boards look at security. How does your board look at security, well, you as the CSO, I'm really fascinated on just how that's evolved at uh, Cisco's board and looking at security. So it's always been my hope not to actually have to go to the board. I mean, there are a lot of people that actually say, oh, I really, really want them to like, listen to me and I want to go present to the board. It's nothing against them, it's just that means that they're focusing on my topic versus something else. And my always, my always hope is to create it at a comfort and transparent level that they're actually thinking, yep, we got, oh yeah, we're good. And they move on to the next topic, which is the thing that we are worried about or have to think about. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work, but I'd rather keep it there as a predominant statement. I have no interest in comparing the number of times I've compared or uh, briefed my board versus you. I, it's just nothing I'm interested in. I'd rather see that they're comfortable all the time and they have the information that they need. Once a year, very oftentimes something of some type will come up that we have to, uh, and my team would have to brief the full board. Um, it could be as simple as, hey, are we supposed to worry about Sony Pictures event and are we ready for that? And can you prove to me without a shadow of a doubt you got that under control? Or it can be, hey, look, the security business that we're building that you know is growing 16 plus percent year over year, last quarter just reported yesterday, just to throw that out there. Um, is, uh, <laughs> is, is that really real? Are we heading the right direction? Can you validate that for us? Is this all going to keep going? That kind of stuff. So my partnership with David Geckler in the security business becomes really important. Uh, but what, 
what it always comes down to is, do you know and have all the conscious risks that we can take and we are taking them, because we do take risks and that's okay, and can you mitigate at speed if we actually go off a little bit off the rails or something happens? Um, so we've evolved this discussion to, here's the metrics by which we measure speed to detect, speed to mitigate, and then of course, not unsurprisingly, business impact. And then the, the final leap over the goal line is to get them all comfortable with their other boards, because that oftentimes is part yeah. of the reason they right. want a briefing. It's right. not only about Cisco Systems Inc., it's about everything else they do with every other company that right. they do it with. And it's because they've realized that the fiduciary responsibility at especially an individual level, they're watching the trend and they believe, our board believes, that number one, that there's gonna be accountability at that level in their career time frame. Um, either SEC or FTC as two prime examples. Two, that potentially software liability, hardware liability, products liability is going to emerge as something that we are going to, as a corporation, have to manage our way through. And three, because half of our business is international, at least, we've got to be able, as a U.S. national co uh, corporate headquartered company, be able to answer the questions around trust and security. Thank you. Yep. Joe and Wendy, you had both talked about the questions are changing. And Joe, you said something that actually surprised me. I was psyched to hear it. You said that your board now sees security as an enabler. Can, can either of you, or, or Kevin as well, what are some examples of specific questions that you're getting now that you weren't getting a couple years ago that would indicate these board members get it and that this is how the, we measure the relationship changing? Well, first, I, I think you see more effective challenge coming from the board hmm. on the program. Um, so I, I, always, I always felt that part of my responsibility was to educate them so that they could challenge me. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable going into a board meeting where everything's going to be okay. Um, you know, and they, they say, oh, thanks for coming in. We all feel better now. Um, so you see that now more than you've ever seen. So part of your board presentation a lot of times is a combination of education on an issue that is, I'm trying to speak English instead of tech uh, when you're doing that. Um, I always felt like yeah, it had to be, I had to be bilingual um, and I wasn't very good at tech anyway, so English seemed to work out better. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I think that educating them and then getting them to effectively challenge you. And then what you see now, and, I, and uh, it wasn't so much the board, but the the business leaders are, are the ones that are saying, you know, well, this could be, That's this great. could help us. This could help us actually sell the institution or the products and services that we offer our customers. And, um, and we also see the, from the customer standpoint, more challenge to the program. What are you doing from a cyber perspective to protect us? So they want to know, um, how are we doing and what are we doing? And obviously, you know, you want to, you want to give them as much information as you can without, giving away the keys to the kingdom on how you're protecting them, but um, that, that's another piece that, that you're starting to see too. That's great, so I heard the boards are challenging you, which is good, yep. so they're, they're getting it. Second, the peer group's engaged, and third, you're hearing it from customers. Correct. Those are all dynamite. Wendy, Kevin, anything on this? Well, I think to add on you know, to what Joe's saying is essentially because of those challenges that are occurring, I think you're seeing a result in different spends. So most of the law firms that are out there that specialize in breach response, or at least those practices, um, are at greater than 50% of the work that they're doing is not responding to events. It's actually bringing proactive security services to their organizations. And we certainly see that from the security and incident response side as well, um, that that's having a direct impact on the investments that are made. And the reality is that, um, you know, I think organizations over the course of life cycles have gone through very difficult challenges. This is still a very a, a technical challenge to overcome, but it, it's not rocket science. So there are approaches that have worked successfully in solving other problems that the board is able to then shed light and share solutions with, you know, influence the integration of security into the, the fiber and the processes with which we operate. Um, and we're seeing really an, an influence in that. We're still not where we need to be, but definitely an improvement. Hmm. Great. And I think from a, a, an enabler perspective, uh, we are seeing uh, organizations that are building very good security organizations themselves and capabilities, and in some cases offering those up as services, uh, especially in the telecommunication space and the, the networking space. You can offer this as a service to your customers, so it's a new service opportunity, in addition to building trust. So I think they're, they're, 
it's, it's the, we got good at it and it's really good and we've built it at scale and so maybe other people can take advantage of the scale in, in, a, in, a, in a unique offering. And so we're seeing that as, as it's like new markets because of the security program's capabilities. Interesting. So, but I, had a, I have a question for, for, for Joe and John. Because Please. one of the one of the the areas, because and John, you mentioned this, the fiduciary responsibility. You know, those are big words. And how do you help your boards understand the difference between you can do a good job from a fiduciary perspective? Doesn't mean you're never going to be hacked. I see that's a it's an area where we get a lot of questions. Like, wait a second, I just got hacked. I'm not doing a good job. Right. Well, you actually you're doing a good job, but. Stuff happens. Uh, well, for, so fraud has got the best comparison here. I mean, I've, I've actually had that conversation with at least one of our external auditors, and the answer was essentially you can build the best fraud program, there's still going to be fraud, it's just the nature of the beast. Their whole trick of the, of the real debate is not so much that is something going to happen or not, it's that you know it's going to happen as a risk category. You've got a decent expectation of the modes by which it would happen. And as a consequence to that, you've put in a set of mitigating controls that control the impact of it happening. Um, and, and I use that big word for a reason on fiduciary responsibility because in, in at least uh, a couple different cases now, it's beginning to show up at least in the preliminary versions of how this is forming out. And again, this is about dots on a line, not a line yet, that uh, especially independent directors may not actually be able to be covered by uh, DNO insurance for things like breach if there is a knowing set of due care, standard due care that was not followed by the corporation. Hmm. And so that, that becomes a very personal problem because then you're like, okay, so I'm sitting on a board of directors, this is a lot of fun, I'm getting paid, this is great, the company's going awesome, this is awesome. And then all of a sudden it's like, what do you mean I'm actually under a personal, personal liable <laughs> condition? And like there's a shareholder lawsuit against the board and I don't get protection from the underwriting insurance that's supposed to protect me as a director or officer. That's the, the gulp factor if, in fact, you didn't pay attention to cyber as a risk area. And you guys know this, right? I mean, this is what the law firms are beginning to sort of triangulate on is, is it, it, it turns into that, okay, so it's going to happen. Got it. Check. How are we going to make sure it doesn't happen a lot and how are we going to handle it when it does? And how are we going to be able to stand in front of you and, and you and me and everybody else, look at each other in the eye and say, okay, we tried to win the game and we lost today. But when you look at us, you don't go, oh, uh, cybersecurity, we've never briefed the board about that topic. Or, oh, actually, we've never even asked if we had a program that had good risk controls. Or we've never compared it to an institutional set of controls like SANS Top 20, 2027-002, something. Those kinds of things, you guys all know this too very well. It's, 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 it's herd theory in some respect, but it's also just, frankly, the knowledge that because they know it's going to happen, they also want to know what you're doing to avoid it. So when they have to explain it, it's not just blank and they, and they feel like they're, they're lost. And just to so add on that, I think the, 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 the impact when you, they all have to know it's going to happen and they all know that now. I mean, that's part of the process of, you know, in, in, inoculating them to the, to the inevitability. Um, so the concept of effective challenge to the program is important so that they are helping, if they get it, put in a situation where they have to defend themselves. You know, there's a, there's, it's documented they effectively challenged the program when you were in there before them. And by the way, I agree with John. I don't like to go to the board as, as much as I have to nowadays. Um, I always felt, you know, working under the um, waterline was always a good place to be. Um, <laughs> but that's, that, that's not working out that way. Uh, the plan's not working out. <laughs> um, so, and, and I think, you know, minimizing the amount of time the hack occurs and your response to it, and being able to effectively demonstrate that to the board that you've, you have plans in place, and that you're testing them, and that you have muscle memory around them, um, helps you know give them that confidence that uh, that you know when when the inevitability happens, you'll be able to deal with it and minimize the impact to the institution. Right. There's an attribute, Jim, if I could add to that, because I think Joe and I would probably say it the same way, and and which is. It, I think there's also an appetite at a board member's level to hear you say, I acknowledge it is going to happen, but I find that unacceptable anyway. 
I will be irritated if it does. I will be, you know, trying to, s to avoid it so it never does. I mean, there's an expectation, and, and I'm just too competitive otherwise. That I, I want to actually make them think, you know what, if this actually, if somebody actually gets this, I'm going to be pissed off. And, and I'm going to get super angry about it. So everything we're trying to do is avoid it. Um, and, and then they get comfortable that you're like, you're really aggressive on trying to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, and then just as equally so, you know, but, handle but it. But that does. emotion is something that most boards are looking for from their CISOs and frankly aren't seeing it. They're not seeing that CISO being pissed that they got hacked. They, they, they see a lot of CISOs, and this is a general statement, so please, uh, that they said, well, I showed the business the risk and they signed off on the uh, uh, exception of approval. And, and, and that, there's nothing that's frustrating these boards more than that. So if, if they walked in and you said, no, -uh, I'm coming in like a samurai, I'm going to start taking people out. I think that, that's what they're looking for from the cybersecurity side, is that someone who's got that passion for the accountability. Well, they also want to see, though, that you're tough on that part of it, though, that you're not giving the exceptions to the, to the, to the security issues that are out there. Uh, they, they want to know that that's well documented in the organization where you're saying, no, we're not going to do it this way. And then when the business lead comes down and tries to pound you into the ground, you say, well, yeah, I'm sorry, but we're not, we're just not going to do that. But then you have the backing of the chief risk officer or somebody who's going to say, hey, you know, this is unacceptable risk. We can't take that. Um, usually that kind of backs people off uh, most of the time. I would say 99% of the time. Is that, uh, is there that one exception? Uh, where something happens, but I haven't found that's where the risk is for the breach. The risk is your employee. Yeah, that's your single most risk. And them clicking on something or doing something stupid um, that causes that breach to occur. They sent an email out with a list of 20,000 customers' names and it was unencrypted and it went to the wrong address. And you know, um, you know yeah, that, that's the thing that, that you can get pissed off about, right? right? That's where you, you say, you, you know, you go in there just as frustrated and upset as anybody about that one incident where, you know, that happens. And, and of course, there is the hacker or the insider that you have to worry about too. But um, I think that, that, and that's an issue, but I, I think the one that I, the one you can really control is that one. Right. Let me please know that I resonate on being angry at that I lost. Not that business risk was taken and it was a good idea at the time and it just happened. I just find it annoying to lose this very, very low stake, high stake, medium stake game where an adversary of some type that I'm up against and my team's up against has managed to win when I rather win all the time. I'm just, that's what I want to be able to do. <laughs> that's what I get angry I about. I what you meant. <laughs> all right, let's, I want to move over to the next topic. We, we spent some time this morning and through the day examining where security fits in digital transformation. John, I read a blog that you put out a couple weeks ago that talked about this concept of a security-led digital transformation, and there was talk about use cases and companies. Tee up this issue for us, and then I want to get some views from some of the others about where we see this, if we see it playing out. So we started off, I've been trying to figure out why, why boards actually care about the topic. And I know it's a risk management exercise and that's part of the reason they care, but I started asking a series of people personally and then there was a team, ironically, in Cisco that was doing additional inquiry into executives. And about 1,100 executives globally were asked questions uh, by Cisco and essentially it went something along the lines of, okay, digitization is, is coming, do you believe in it? And of course, check the box, everyone has either just agreed that it's happening or it's already happening or whatever mode you are in this in this spectrum. And then of course the next question was, or next comment that I should say came along with it is, and we're actually worried our company is going to get disrupted in the next three years by a new business model that we haven't seen coming. So we've got to get this digitization, digital, you know, fast pace enablement going quickly. Okay, cool. Not a security conversation yet, clearly. So that was uh, well over um, probably about 40 to 50% self-evidentially saying they're worried their company was not going to be as relevant as it was now within the next three to five years. Huh. This, this next click in though got fascinating to us because as they said it, they basically correlated that they had to get digital for their own corporations going quicker and that was two thirds. And then one third of that group said, we're actually either stopping projects because we're worried about security risk or 
more importantly, we actually have switched gears and went a third of us actually believe that our company's differentiation could be because of security. Hmm. And I think they hopefully meant in the positive, not like <laughs> the negative. Um, but so, so all of a sudden it became a whole different business conversation with, with our customers. So then we started studying business markets. And if you do all of that ag aggregated against essentially the, the global 2000 and beyond, what we narrowed down was about 407 use cases of digitization that were happening in industries, representing just around $6 trillion of revenue over the next 10 years that would be affected by this conversation. So add it all up. Digital is important to us because it's going to be making our company survive. We're actually worried about cyber risk, slowing down, stopping projects, and yet still believe we could differentiate our brand. There's about five to six trillion dollars of revenue in this discussion that better be able to be captured by us. And last but not least, if we don't get it right, we already know we're going anywhere from six months to 18 months slower than we want to. Which essentially means the value capture of that six trillion isn't coming as quickly as it could if they only felt comfortable about cyber risk. That tells you where the gumming up of the machines has, has now fully occurred. Yeah, I'll tell you what, though, that's encouraging in that it's a, a long way from HIPAA or a PCI discussion. Very much, <laughs> yeah. very much. And, and frankly, I think it's, it's better that it goes this way because there's, there's a, more of an appetite by business leaders to, to do what the business is supposed to be doing, which is figure out how to get to the goals of the business, right? And if yeah. you, can, if you can, can remove one of the obstacles, not because it's gone completely, but it's embedded, then that, that whole entire motion gets smoother. Right, right. Um, I, I know for sure I could be a better runner if I just ran more. I just know it's a big impediment that I hate to run. <laughs> and Wendy and I were talking about that just a little while ago. Um, so if you, if you can get it into the, into the sort of the system and then remove that barrier, then there's in fact revenue capture that, uh, that in fact will keep their business relevant. It's incredible. And I, Kevin, we've talked about some of these same issues up front is that security driving growth. Can you talk a little bit, or if you see, what are some industries or use cases where you think might be some early adopters of some of the points that John was discussing? Yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've had some already on the discussions today. So hospitality, digital is changing the experience of the user as they come into you know, bypassing the front desk and, and having all of those services available to them. Certainly the way we buy things in retail, uh, the, that seamless retail environment of buy it from any device anywhere, just get it and it shows up at my door, big area. But but even well, uh, utilities and energy, the way we deliver is, yeah, it's molecules and electrons, but the, the digital infrastructure that's driving that is, is exploding. Um, so I think that the, the, the question is really, what industries aren't being affected by digital. I and mean, one of the things that, that Accenture and, and Pierre Nantern, who's our CEO, he's, he, every analyst report, uh, every business is a digital business. And the, the, the businesses that don't capture this now, like John just said, are, they're, you're, you're going to be left on the side. Yeah. So uh, the, the next statement, which is a wonderful thing, we finally got this in the vernacular with, across all of Accenture, is that insecure digital doesn't make sense. So, so it has sure. to be it has to be foundational sure. to to deliver the trust and the promise, in addition to the efficiencies. I, we're getting tight on time, but Wendy, a question I want to come to is something when we were prepping for this, you were telling me about the the new job at IBM and the role of Watson, and that I did a, read a piece that you guys put out about cognitive security. Mm -hmm. but where does Watson and cognitive security fit into this conversation? Sure. So, you know, when we look at the ability to defend networks, right, you're looking at, um, you know, those who are m mature enough to have processes in place, have analysts that are mining data, um, are just bombarded with these large volumes of data. It's like an average organization has 200,000 events in their SIM per day. Um, there's 60,000 security blogs that are published per month. Um, I don't think any single one of us was able to consume all 60,000 of those each month. And somewhere in the ballpark of 75,000 and security vulnerabilities that exist at any time and point. So when you look at um, you know, these major breaches that have occurred, Target's a good example where they got really hammered in the press for they missed an, a fire eye alert in their network data. Well, it, the reality is you know, we see that time and time again, right? Organizations that buy the best of breed technologies have people assigned to it, but the, 
those people probably have five different jobs if they're lucky, that's only five roles, and there's no way that they can then uh, focus effectively um, in anywhere but kind of the most mature organizations who've invested by this point probably hundreds of millions of dollars into really identifying, you know, where's the needle in the haystack and how do I prioritize this massive volume of data that I'm getting? And so, um, you know, Cyber, well, Watson, I will say, and then Cyber Watson, but Watson, if anyone's not familiar, um, look for some of the, the commercials or just Google Watson. Um, you know, we've done a, a number of commercials about, you know, it's a, essentially a robot going into artificial intelligence and cognitive computing and really thinking about how can we allow a machine to make us faster and moving into or away from the era, era of programmable computing, which is, you know, we program a computer to, we provide it input and it provides output that we expect to cognitive, which is the ability for that machine to then um, ingest information, train it, and then have it start making inferences and, and thinking and coming to some decisions for uh, on its own. And so we're not looking to replace human jobs, but at the same time, in this industry alone, there are uh, projected to be 1.5 million job vacancies in 2020. So those are unfilled jobs that right now have to be filled by superhumans, right? We put the best of our, our smartest people into doing this um, analysis, give them these massive amounts of data. Well, we see there's, there's just a huge skills gap. So applying the ability to, to leverage a supercomputing type of machine with cognitive ability is something, uh, for me, the, the thing I was most excited about joining IBM on. If you think about, you know, can we apply that to unstructured data, these 60,000 blogs per month, and then I can ingest that knowledge and allow the computer to start helping me pinpoint and prioritize my actions, and then how does that affect incident response and detection, and then really getting into effective prevention, um, effective remediation, taking parts of the system offline because we see that they, these might be um, you know, vulnerable to the, the next step, what happens next, and we just don't have the ability, I think, in this industry right now to automate that process, to have it integrated into the business flows really, truly effectively. So that, that's really where we're, what we're excited about. I, I don't normally ask this one question to everybody, but I want to do this on this point. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, so hang on. Um, we started the day talking about the question is, how do we create growth securely? How do leaders do that? And John, I want to pick up on the theme from your blog, a security-led digital transformation. Kind of, we're talking out here to the web, we're being streamcast. What advice do you have for CEOs who say, in this age of golden age of innovation and digital transformation, what do you recommend CEOs do to make sure they win on this point? Oh, you can start with John. I got to think about this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, first and foremost, I, I don't think security is a, a delegation of anything. I, I, I think I've only worked with companies where the CEO is paying attention to this topic, like personally. Um, so number one is if, if, a, if you're a CEO of any business type and, and you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, security is that team over there or it's the CIO's problem or, or responsibility or whatever, I would highly recommend retraining your thinking process uh, right now. Um, you'll discover you're going to be in the news having to talk to investors or you're going to discover you're going to be on the television and streaming sites of, of having to talk about this topic anyway. So you might as well just evolve right now as fast as possible and get it in your own natural language. The second thing is, you know, back to, to the point you know, at least made once or twice so far, um, use it, you know, figure out a way to use it to your advantage. Um, at, at a business level. Find a vehicle by which it intersects your business strategy and then suddenly becomes a means by which it's going to help you. Maybe not unto itself. It might be just something as simple as, you know, you're making IT decisions based on data uh, structures or business decisions based on information that, that essentially makes your business more efficient and you have to keep that accurate so it's a security conversation. Yep, yep. But it becomes a more important way by which you deliver whatever it is you're doing. And then the final piece of advice um, that I would always uh, always give a, a CEO is if you don't a if you don't have a head of security get one but b if you do have a head of security get to know him or her preferably her by the way let's get some diversity in this discussion in a real hurry um, and uh, um, and 
And and by knowing them, I mean at a, at a personal level. Like it, it's been a real real joy of my life to be able to know John Chambers as well as I have, and and get to know Chuck Robbins and his new CEO role, uh, because we as senior security people learn from business leaders, and they as business leaders are learning from us as security people. And that if you think about in the end analysis of what we better get right in the next generation of all this is to blend the two so that this all works. Fantastic advice. Joe, that's a tough act to follow, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be really concise and make security uh, the first thing you think about when you're going to deploy a new product or service hmm. um, and make force security engagement with the business at the outset. And I think that if I was the CEO and or if the CEO asked me that question, I'd say, just bring us in at the, at the outset before you pick a solution. Great. Wendy? Um, so to me, it kind of goes back to the age-old question of asking a bank robber, why did you rob a bank? And the Secret Service person over here knows the answer. That's because that's where the money is. So the reality is that all of our organizations now have data that can be monetized. And so these attacks, fraud, they're not going away anytime soon. So understanding where your most um, rich data exists within your environment, and I'm not talking about, you know, we say sometimes crown jewels and focusing on that data, but, you know, we're looking at whole departments, HR departments departments, finance departments, marketing departments, um, their data is worth a lot of money to someone who's going to resell it um, within the black market. And so getting those people involved with your security decisions, realizing it's not an isolated security problem, but it's truly a business problem these days. Kevin, cleanup hitter. So, so yeah, so it, 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 we started the, the, the conversation and even in the day that this is a business problem, not a technical problem. Yep. And if we want to be a good business, we have to do this well. Uh, it, it's an imperative for the way we build trust with our customers, with our shareholders, with our employees, and we just have to do this right. It's really not optional. It's not a bolt-on, it's a baked in. Great. Now, I've managed to blow through a lot of the Q&A time, but we can extend for a couple minutes because this is a great panel. Um, questions for anybody to any of the panelists? I th I've got one right in the center there, yep. Could you introduce yourself when you when you say hi to us so we know who you are? Vandana Upadhyay from Confia Systems. Uh, you brought up that security is now being viewed as a business enabler. So I come from business background and whenever that happens, we start measuring. We start looking for ROI or some kind of metrics or KPIs. So can you talk about how organizations are tying it into those kind of metrics and if some methodologies are emerging? So I, I think um, what, what you're looking for is uh, how security is helping protect against events. So that's one metric um, uh, for a company if they're a customer as a business enabler, um, how you're able to cross sell certain products or services that have more security or less security. Uh, so the, the, um, the, the products that are sell selling from a cross-sell perspective, those also play into it. So those are some of the metrics that, uh, from a business enablement standpoint, that uh, they would look for, the business would look for from an ROI perspective. I can give you a couple other ones. So we're actually tracking the frequency in which security questions are coming in as part of an RFI, RFP, or even the, the sort of addendum to a contract. Um, and by the way, there are now countries that are putting requirements in to sell into things like public sector, Germany is a pretty good example of this, that you actually have to be able to attest to certain things or there's financial penalties if you don't do them and they're all cyber related. Um, and so if you track that model, it, you can imagine if a customer comes in with a question that you can't answer, it slows the whole process down. So the next natural thing to measure that we do is how fast do we actually have an answer that's satisfying the customer that presumably it's a reasonable question um, and if we don't then you know to what cost enablement structure would it would it in, in fact require for us to be able to get there all of that is speed to saying yes is a, is a lack of a better way to put it in terms of business metrics um, that enable deal flow that ultimately enable you know ultimately a customer so that's, that's sort of general class number one. Class number two, I mentioned this a minute ago, is we're now watching customers that are, their words, not ours, saying the reason I went with you versus whoever else is the following cyber or whatever you know, part of this 
thing you want to use as a word, attributes of your offer, your service offering, your product offering, your operations, whatever. In some cases, it's how we're handling data to the point that Wendy just made a minute ago about you know you, that's where the data is and you handle it right. Other cases, it's how we built the, the product itself. So the secure development lifecycle that we follow in engineering. Then still other cases, it's the fact that we can do attestation against four and five and six different ways of being measured for cybersecurity controls. It's all these kinds of things. And, the, and, and I look for trend lines. I, you know, it's not so much that every customer, even 50% of our customers are asking this yet. It's just that each year it's getting higher. And that suggests everything I think I need to know in order to be the, the litmus test of knowing for sure this is gonna just keep going. In the back. Thank you. It's done. Um, all right. Uh, thank you for this very informative and thought-provoking uh, discussion. My question is um, to tell, actually, tag along John's point about doing business internationally. Um, it's about if you can think of the top three most rewarding decisions uh, or best practices when it comes to the cultural or um, differences when you do businesses internationally, uh, say in a very culturally different um, place such as China, if you can think of top three most rewarding um, decisions or practices. Thank you. Any opinion from the practice side of Accenture? Um, gosh, so we, we, just, we spend a lot of time with, with the leadership uh, w within the various countries. Uh, and uh, I think there were a couple of conversations earlier and even the, from the Secret Service discussion of, of uh, you have to think differently in, in Russia. They, we, we are short, we're impatient, we're aggressive in having to take in some some of the, the the thought processes of okay how is this going to be received whether it's in China whether it's in in uh, India uh, or, or or another country so we we do spend a lot of time trying to understand how we're going to be perceived when we're rolling out the the ideas or the approach um, we we do have a, a, a internally we're spending a lot of time of are we thinking like an American are we thinking about it from a technical bottom up solutions we try to think about what what's the problem we're trying to solve and, and put it in the context of their business from their their local whether it's uh, personal beliefs or country laws or, or what have you so it's really kind of a try to distance from the American perspective into that country's perspective. Uh, whether it's on data or privacy or things that we might take for granted or just perceive differently. Hmm. Listen, I would love to continue, but we're running a little bit late. And so I think uh, if you have questions for the panelists, I'm sure they'll be able to stick around for a couple minutes. But uh, please join me in a round of applause for our four panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Jason Kaufman, Manager, Managing Principal of the Chertoff Group, to the stage. Come on through, guys. So look, I can be quick. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this was just a terrific event. I've had the privilege of calling Jim Flaging my business partner for the last five years, and I know two things about Jim. He's passionate about his Golden State Warriors. He's passionate about security. But Jim, what you forgot is, as your business partner, um, I'm a lifelong Cleveland Cavaliers fan, lifelong Cleveland sports fan, which I think makes me, <laughs> but I think that makes me an insider threat. It definitely makes me a malicious actor, and we're, we're coming to get you. Uh, just give us a little bit of time. Um, but if you think back to the things that Jim said this morning about the purpose of today we were going to talk about, uh, you know, we're going to talk about enabling growth um, in the context of digital security uh, and individual privacy. And we did that within the framework of the three T's, those sort of three big ideas that we all have to understand of technology, uh, trust, and the other three, uh, the other T that I'm blanking on right now because I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. But uh, <laughs> threat, threat, of course, threat. And we heard great things about um, uh, threat from some of our um, terrific speakers. Uh, we had a phenomenal panel. We had um, phenomenal breakout sessions. And I think as a result, we really did end up having uh, the best uh, security series that we've, that we've ever had. 
Um, all of this is really the brainchild of Jim Flagging. And without it, without him and his creativity and his vision, none of this would be possible. And I'd just like everyone to take a moment and recognize Jim for, for his visionary leadership and making this a, a, a success. Uh, just a few reminders before I let you go. If you've not already done so, there are surveys on all of your tables. Um, please take some time to fill them out. Um, if you missed a session or you want to share this with your colleagues, uh, this will be posted to YouTube in about a week. We'll send around a link. Um, and finally, I want to pause um, and just take a moment to thank our sponsors. Uh, Accenture Strategy, Arbor Networks, Cisco, uh, Coal Fire Systems, Microsoft, uh, and SailPoint. And then, of course, our event partners, Bay Area Council, CalCISO, uh, Passcode uh, from the Christian Science Monitor, and um, Tenfold. Lastly, our team at Chertoff um, has worked tirelessly to make today possible, um, especially just a few people I want to recognize, Katie Montgomery, Anna Stallman, Casey Jacquez, Davin Baker, Andrea Katzer, and, and Hal Libby. Um, please just take a moment, join me in a round of applause for them um, and all their efforts. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, hope to see you next time, and please uh, take some time to engage with our sponsors. Thank you.